Good morning, dear colleagues. Today's theme is topography of upper extremity. As always, topographical questions, questions are most complicated, most clinically oriented, and that's why usually in all our types of exams we uh, pay most important attention to this question. That means if you forgot attachment of one muscle, it may be estimation three balls, but if you forgot any anatomical, topographical question, it will be estimation two. So that's why let's try to study in details these um, topographically questions. And first of it will be fossa axillaris, axillary fossa. Uh, for understand where is it, we can use this picture. So it's the place where we usually put the thermometer for uh, knowing the temperature of our body. We should say that fossa axillaris has a shape of four-sided pyramid. And also this pyramid has the base oriented down and an apex oriented on the neck into the supraclavicular fossa. And uh, next important detail that fossa axillaris contains a lot of vessels, nerves, lymph nodes and all these structures are surrounded by the fat. So that's why usually if we try to palpate something inside of axillary fossa, in the norm we can't uh, feel any vessels. But usually we can palpate that there are a lot of fats there, which surrounds these vessels. But sometimes we can palpate lymph nodes. Usually it's due to any uh, inflammation or small injury in the skin, because lymph nodes Uh, have have uh, the function uh, to control all lymph vessel according to the uh, any uh, foreign small uh, particles and uh, microorganisms. So, now let's continue anatomical question about fossa axillaris. Now, we shall use two pictures of fossa axillaris, which we obtained in horizontal section. This is from left side of our body, and we are looking from above. So the head was cut it and removed, and we are looking here from above. Here it is for axillaris. We can say that is that in this picture for axillaris is without content. And now I shall use another example with content. If you try compare to our cadavers in 
classroom 4 and in the classroom 3, they differ from each other due to numerous vessels and nerves in classroom 3 because it's nerve, nerve uh, vessels uh, cadaver and uh, in classroom 4 there are only muscles but all uh, vessels were removed so we can say that in the left picture we are watching the fossa axillaris without any vessels and fat and uh, so this is fossa axillaris from muscular uh, cadaver and this is fossa axillaris with content from nero vascular cadaver this is quite complicated picture so that's why i propose you to draw it together step by step use large page in your sheets and let's begin so horizontal section of left axillary fossa view from above and first of all we shall draw the rib costa here it is a rib we are looking from above from the side of head so now what is it it's scapula and uh, now laterally what is it it's humerus <coughs> and now let's draw the muscles here there we ought to know each muscle so let's try to distinguish them this is serratus anterior it covers the ribs and also is attached to the scapula this is musculus subscapularis from anterior surface of the scapula and this is musculus infraspinatus on posterior surface of the scapula and now musculus pectoralis minor and more superficially musculus pectoralis major practically all these structures are walls of axillary fossa also let's draw some tendons or transversely sex sectioned muscles they are musculus biceps with two capitis two heads caput breve musculus bicepitis brachia and caput longum musculus bicepitis brachia pay attention that caput breve is more medially oriented and caput longum is more laterally oriented and uh, this is caput longum musculus tricipitis brachia which is uh, positioned close to the scapula in this picture the upper extremity is uh, 
in normal, in correct position. It isn't uh, abducted or rotated. It's normal position. And uh, now let's try to distinguish the walls. So, number one. What is it? It's anterior wall. What muscles are muscles of anterior wall? There too. Pectoralis minor, pectoralis major. So, anterior wall consists of two muscles, musculus pectoralis major and minor. Then, number two, what is it? Number two is posterior wall and it consists of musculus subscapularis together with scapula. So here it is, posterior wall of axillary fossa. And sure there is a medial wall. It consists of musculus serratus anterior together with the ribs and laterally is lateral wall which is presented by the humerus column humeri only by the bone and now when we know the walls of axillary fossa we should know also the content of axillary fossa. First of all, number one is, excuse me, number five, number five is of red color vessel. Sure, it's easy to understand that it is arteria, arteria axillaris. Number five is arteria axillaris. Easy to remember that in fossa axillaris we shall find arteria axillaris. Near to it, number six of blue color, its vein, vena axillaris. And uh, it should be good to say that number seven is nervous axillaris, but no. It is three large bundles, nerve bundles, which surrounds arteria axillaris and they called as plexus brachialis. Sure, they are nerves, but they form so named plexus brachialis. The uh, animal nerve system uh, large nerve bands bundles which then will be innervate the muscles of upper extremity and now number eight of green color what they are they are lymph nodes or lymphonodi axillares. In plural, it's written because there are several lymph nodes in axillary fossa. So now we practically finished this question and now. The continuation of it, the openings on posterior wall of axillary fossa. Here it is, posterior wall. And what are the openings, the holes 
which connects axillary fossa with the uh, dorsal surface of the arm and back. So, we shall use this picture from Sapin textbook and uh, I use now this triangle with color lines with bo uh, blue color lines and it demonstrates number six for ramen trilaterum for ramen trilaterum its first hole first opening which leads from axillary fossa to the back and in opposite direction from the back to axillary fossa and the second opening is foramen quadrilaterum foramen quadrilaterum it's clear that there are four angles and four sides that's why foramen quadrilaterum and uh, again it connects for axillaris with the dorsal surface of the for a arm uh, of the arm and uh, and the back now let's try to learn each of it more detailly and we shall begin from foramen trilaterum now I shall use another picture from anterior view. So, foramen trilaterum from anterior view. Let's try to understand what is here. It's a scapula with musculus subscapularis. It's processus caracaidus. So, here it is. Biceps brachii, here it is brachialis, and foramen trilaterum, here it is. So foramen trilaterum, it has three walls. First wall, number one. It is superior wall. I'd like to uh, point that now we watch this region in correct anatomical position, but in the previous picture the arm was abducted so that wasn't normal or correct anatomical position when we call the walls of foramen trilaterum we shall always remember that the positioning of the wall should be made in correct anatomical position so number one is superior wall and what is the muscle which forms it musculus subscapularis we can say that it's inferior part inferior fibers of musculus subscapularis and then number two is inferior wall which is formed by musculus teres Meyer. Here it is, teres Meyer. And third wall is lateral wall. 
which is formed by caput longum musculis tricipitis brachii. We are looking from anterior view, but nevertheless we can see caput longum musculus tricipitis brachii, which belongs to the dorsal group of muscles of the arm. And what is content of foram trilaterum? The content is arteria et vena circumflexa scapuli. Here they are. Arteria et vena circumflexa scapuli. So we can say that through foramen trilaterum, arteria et vena circumflexa scapuli pass from axillary fossa onto the back. And there you can fight them on the back. And now another looking for foramen trilaterum from posterior view. Foramen trilaterum from posterior view. Here it is. This black arrow demonstrates us from trilateral from posterior and it's interesting but the walls will be a little bit different in the posterior surface in comparison with, with anterior so superior wall now is formed by Musculus teres minor. Here it is, musculus teres minor. And inferior wall number two is formed by musculus teres major. And lateral wall number three, it's the same caput longum musculus. Tricipitis brachii. And now the next foramen quadrilaterum. We shall begin from the same picture, from back view, and foramen quadrilaterum is designated now with red color arrow. And now let's call the walls. Here it is superior wall, musculus teres minor. Here it is inferior wall, number two, musculus teres major. Here it is medial wall, caput longum. Musculus tricipitis brachii. You can see that these three walls are the same as in foram trilaterum, only caput longum musculus tricipitis brachii is medial wall for foram quadrilaterum and is lateral wall for foram trilaterum. It's naturally but lateral wall in foramen quadrilaterum is u1 it's column brachii it's column humeri it's column humeri uh, you can see that for demonstrating foramen quadrilaterum in correct anatomical position, it's correct anatomical position. Do you agree? We need to cut musculus deltaidus in two places. 
that's why we can see now the column humeri and we can see also musculus infraspinatus and teres minor. If musculus deltaidus would be intact, not cut it, so all this region will be closed, so invisible. We shouldn't demonstrate these structures. And what is the content of Faram Quadrilaterum? The content is um, Arteria et vena circumflexa humeri, here they are, and nervus axillaris. Arteria et vena circumflexa humeri posterior and nervus axillaris. And now, when we have studied these two openings, now let's, in this picture, also try to learn another structure, a special canal, which is here. It was also cutted and part of muscle was removed to demonstrate it. What is it? It's canalis humero muscularis. Canalis humero muscularis. First of all, we should like to say that canalis humero muscularis has uh, some synonyms. They are Canalis nervi radialis. Now, may I ask you about the content of this canal? Surely, you can say that in this canal we shall find nervus radialis because the another name of it, canalis nervi radialis. Here it is of yellow color. It's canalis, it's nervus radialis. And together with the nervus radialis, it's a good possibility to say about general anatomical rule that usually no nerves, no vessels goes separately. They go together. They form neuromuscular bundle and here an example of such neuromuscular bundle that together with the nervus radialis we can find two arteria and veins that vessels together with nerve the content we shall write down several minutes later and now we write down third name of this canal, canalis spiralis. Why? Because it begins, it starts medially and they in spiral direction, it surrounds the superior part of the humeral bone and it finished laterally. So name canalis spiralis means the way of direction of this canal. So we can use all three this name and understand that it's the same structure canalis humor muscularis or canalis nervi radialis or canalis spiralis. And now let's point out that it originates on the medial surface 
of the shoulder in the upper third part of it. This is upper third part of the shoulder. and it originates below this muscle. What is it? It's musculus teres mayor. So the origination of this canal will be below musculus teres mayor. And uh, the end of this canal we can find on the lateral surface of the shoulder, in the lower third part of it, between musculus brachialis and musculus brachioradialis. So I recommend you to find nervus radialis in our specimen of the arm between these two muscles, musculus brachialis and musculus brachioradialis. When we find nervus radialis, we can say, here it is, we can demonstrate an end of canalis humeri muscularis. And again about the content. Content is arteria et vena profunda brachi, here they are, and nervus radialis. These vessels named as arteria et vena profunda brachi. And now, let us go down and learn canalis carpalis. Canalis carpalis. Another question. Canalis carpalis, we can find if we shall use this transverse section according to this line. If we do such section, we can find such kind of structure. What is it? Let's try to find any detail. These are the bones of the carpus. And laterally, of these four bones, we can find fifth bone, os metacarpi prima. Try to find all this bones on the skeleton and arrange any arrow according to this line to demonstrate all these bones. So, os metacarpi prima, then os trapezium, then os trapezoidum, then os capitatum, then os hamatum. Can you answer me? Is it proximal or distal row of carpal bones? Sure, distal row. And now, this is the skin and fascia, and uh, between os trapezium and os hamatum, they are part of eminence carpi radialis and eminence carpi ulnaris. Passes this structure. What is it? It's fascious or uh, fibrous tissue which forms retinaculum flexorum. Retinaculum flexorum. Here it is, retinaculum flexorum. It's thickened fascia or large ligament. Ligament which connects 
oschamatum and os trapezium, which connects ligamentum, which connects, excuse me, uh, eminenza carpi radialis and eminenza carpi ulnaris. And between the bones of carpus and this ligament, which named retinaculum flexorum, we can find this space. It's canal. It's canalis carpalis. Here it is, canalis carpalis. For understanding another structures, let's draw the tenor, the group of muscles of thumb, and the hypotenor, the group of muscles of fifth finger. And uh, now we can say that canalis carpalis is placed here. It's very important in uh, uh, in practice to know the content of this canal. What is the content? First of all, we shall use these four structures similar to each other and we designate them with number one. What is it? It's tendines musculi flexoris digitorum superficialis. Musculus flexor digitorum superficialis divides into four tendons, tendons, which pass through this canal. And then, more deeply, we can find also four similar structures, which are the tendons of musculus flexor digitorum profundus. Also four tendons. They are arranged in two layers, more superficial and more profound. And be attentive now. What is it? Number three. Yellow color. And it means it's nerve. Nervus medianus. One of the large nerve of uh, anterior surface of the hand. And you can see that it is placed between retinaculum flexorum and the tendons. That's why nervus medianus could be damaged, could be uh, injured during some uh, movements. And uh, Uh, about 15 years ago, when cell phones with small knobs of keyboard appeared, there were a lot of uh, a lot of we can say that this is disease, disease which was connected with the pain in the hand and difficulties of movement of, of the fingers. Why? Because uh, the man wasn't used earlier 
to do these movements of the first finger when we try to push on the knobs of the cell phone. <laughs> and syndrome of carpal, carpal tunnel or carpal kennel, that was the diagnosis. Syndrome of carpal, carpal tunnel, here it is, carpal tunnel or carpal kennel. What is it? It's injury of the nervus medianus due to its very narrow space and unusual movements of the finger of the thumb was a reason of such disease. It's quite interesting. Earlier it isn't usual but when appeared new devices which was absent earlier absent uh, and that was uh, that's wh why appeared a new disease and now now uh, part of this canal canalis carpi radialis it's part of canalis carpalis canalis carpi radialis so we can see that between retinaculum flexorum and tos trapezium there is a special uh, ligament which divides canalis carpalis into two parts one of it canalis carpi radialis number four and what we can find here what is the content of it content is tendo musculus flexoris pollicis longi here it is flexor pollicis longus and its tendon and also it helps us to understand that this muscle, musculus flexor pollicis longus, goes with a tendon separately from musculus flexor digitorum profundus and superficialis. They are separated by a special uh, fibrous ligament. And now I use new picture for demonstrate number five musculus palmaris longus which is placed the most superficially and this picture can demonstrate us that musculus palmaris longus is separated from another muscles by retinaculum flexorum. So, musculus palmaris longus number five is localized most superficially. And now, close to it, we can demonstrate to structures part of neurovascular bundle. This is number six and seven. They're placed here. They are arteria ulnaris, number six and nervus ulnaris number seven. We can find them close to hypotenor and the retinaculum flexorum 
superficially. And uh, the last detail, number eight. Here it is. It's arteria radialis. Arteria radialis. It is placed in anatomical sniff box and uh, uh, according to canalis carpalis it's out of it and now another important question synovial sheets of the hand I use this example as a photo of anatomical specimen and near to it scheme for we can compare them. So it's palmar surface. So what is it? RF. Retinaculum flexorum, sure. We already said that it limits canalis carpalis. But now, for us, also quite important that under retinaculum flexorum, This muscle, musculus flexor pollicis longus, has uh, the tendon which is surrounded by a special synovial sheet. Practically, we can't demonstrate it in, in specimen, but it's very important to know how it passes and uh, to understand that the inflammation of this sheet could uh, lead to form special cysts and be painful. Sometimes it leads to necessity to surgical operation. So, number one, vagina tendinis musculi flexoris pollicis longi. Vagina tendinia, musculus flexoris polyslot. Then we can find strange shape structure, also synovial sheet, which surrounds tendons of uh, musculi flexoris uh, flexor. Uh, Digitorum, flexor digitorum. And it's interesting that it continuing into the fifth finger. So uh, if we have inflammation of synovial sheet here in the wrist, it could be prolong it into fifth finger. But it's rare to find prolongation of such uh, inflammation into second, third and fourth fingers. Why? Because here we can find different separated number three Vagine digitorum manus. And in our specimen, it's also quite good seen that to second, third, and fourth fingers, the synovial sheet is separated from the common sheet of vagina tendinum musculorum flexorum. Very interesting situation. 
And now the last number four designation, which we can find only in the scheme. Zwagina tendinis musculi flexoris carpi radialis. It passes in canalis carpi radialis. But why we can demonstrate it here in the specimen? Because the tendon of this muscle was uh, cut it especially to demonstrate a vagina tendinis musculus flexor pollicis longus. That's why we can't find this synovial sheet on the specimen. But scheme can explain us the positioning of this synovial sheets on the hand. That was palmar surface. And now analogous structures on the dorsal surface. If here on palmar surface we named the structures as synovial sheets, on the dorsal surface we shall use term osteofibrous canals. Osteo fibrous canals. Here it is, the picture, and we can say that on the border with dorsal surface of the hand, fascia antebrahi forms a thickening which called retinaculum extensorum, which connects with the back surface of the radius and ulna bones. So here on the ends they are connected with the os radius and os ulna. And uh, under retinaculum extensorum six osteofibrous canals pass through for extensor tendons of fingers and hand. And the walls of these canals are lined with synovial membrane, here it is, which is above and below retinaculum extensorum, roped around the tendons and covers them forming the tendon sheet vagina tendinum. Again, like in palmar surface. So, these extensor muscles, they pass through retinaculum extensorum in six canals. So, we should know each of these canals and let's try to numerate them. So, bone fibrous channel numbering and their content. Number one, what is it? Number one is musculus abductor pollicis longus together with extensor pollicis brevis. Here we can find the muscles and in first canal pass the tendons surrounded by the Vagina synovialis or synovial sheet. Then number two is musculus extensoris carpi radialis longus et brevis. Both of them, extensor carpi radialis, which attached to the 
basis of second metacarbal bone, here it is, and extensor carpi radialis brevis, which is attached to the third metacarpal bone. And then number three, what is it, number three? Third canal, where we can find musculus extensor pollicis longus. Extensor pollicis longus. Again, I'd like to remember that this space is called as anatomical sniff box. Anatomical sniff box. Here it is. We can find it in our own hand. And number four, it's fourth canal for musculus extensor digitorum. Number four is fourth canal for musculus extensor digitorum. And number five is fifth canal for musculus extensor digitiminimi. And last number. Six is a canal for musculus extensor carpi ulnaris. So this scheme can help us not only to numerate the canals under retinaculum extensorum, but also to better remember the topography of the muscles for best finding this muscle in the specimen. And it doesn't concern to this theme, but I'd like to demonstrate the small muscles on dorsal surface of the palm. What they are? One, two, three, under this tendon, and four. It's dorsal interosseous muscle, muscles. Musculi interosseus dorsalis. Here they are. Four muscles in four inter metacarpal spaces so it's the most important questions of topography in upper extremity be prepared for electronic tests thank you Пациенту ему не звонит. А, у тебя включено и включено.